Mr. Mayor, Mr. Director Fossil, thank you so much for those warm words of introduction. And thank you all for being here, including especially those of you who are standing above us. <laughs> Now, this is my third visit to Poland, my first visit to Gdansk, and yesterday I had the opportunity to tour this magnificent center. And I have, even in the day and a half that I've been here, I have two dominant impressions. First, what an, an inspiring and moving place you have created here to celebrate the memory and to honor the meaning of the solidarity movement that began here in the shipyards of Gdansk. My second dominant impression is that for a student of politics, this is an interesting time to visit Poland. <laughs> now, in this lecture, I would like to connect these two impressions. I would like to offer a diagnosis of our current political circumstance. And I would like to suggest what lessons we might learn from the history of the Solidarity Movement, lessons that may be relevant to addressing the political crisis that confronts us. And so I would like to do this in two parts. I would like to identify, first of all, and to try to articulate, and perhaps to elaborate and reinterpret the conception of solidarity that found such powerful expression here in the shipyards. And then to ask what lessons we can learn from it. Because it seems to me that rearticulating, reappropriating the experience of solidarity is necessary to addressing the crisis of democracy today. The project of revitalizing democracy depends, it seems to me, on renewing, on reviving solidarity as a moral ideal and as a political practice. And so my project is to diagnose what led to the current state, and I would say the dangerous state, of democracy today. And then to engage with you in a project of retrieval to show how solidarity properly understood offers the best hope for revitalizing democratic public life in our time. So let me begin with the philosophical part. What actually does the ideal of solidarity mean? It seems to me there are two different ways of understanding solidarity, a universalistic way and what might be called a situated or particularist way. Now the universalistic conception of solidarity emphasizes the obligations we have as moral beings, as human persons, toward all our fellow human beings. It's the moral demand 
the moral requirement that we respect persons as persons, that we respect human dignity, that we overcome the pull of particularity, whether it be particularity of self-interest or a prejudice for one's own kind. This is the universalistic ideal of solidarity. And historically, it's found a number of different moral and philosophical sources and inspirations. One source can be found in the Christian tradition of solidarity, the tradition that reminds us that all human persons are created in the image of God. There is on the wall of the final exhibit in the center a quote from Pope John Paul II that expresses this universalist conception of solidarity to look into the eyes of another human, he said. And to see the hopes and anxieties of a brother or sister is to discover the meaning of solidarity. In his encyclical on social concern of 1987, Pope John Paul II emphasized this universal dimension of solidarity. It's not a feeling of vague compassion or shallow distress at the misfortunes of people near and far, he wrote. On the contrary, it's a firm and persevering determination to commit oneself to the common good, that is to say, to the good of all and of each individual. We also find this Christian conception of solidarity as a universalistic ideal in the essay by Joseph Tischner, the essay mentioned by the mayor. He tells the parable of the Good Samaritan who helps the stranger by the side of the road, not even knowing who that person is, but out of compassion and out of mercy out of universal human concern. And yet, as I'll mention later, though Tishner begins with this example of solidarity, the universalistic one, it becomes clear, as one reads through the full essay, that he also draws our attention to the second dimension of solidarity, the situated or the particularist one. Before I turn to that second dimension, it's worth noticing that Christian theology is not the only source of the universalist conception of solidarity. One also finds this in the moral philosophy of the Enlightenment, for example. In Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative, respecting human dignity, respecting persons as persons rather than using them as ends or as instruments. Now, one of the most dramatic expressions of the Enlightenment conception of solidarity is universalistic comes from the philosopher Montesquieu he dramatizes the moral stakes in asserting the priority of universal moral ties over the pull of the particular. He puts it very vividly. If I knew something useful to me, he wrote, but prejudicial to my family, I would reject it from my soul. If I knew something useful to my family, but not to my country, I would try to forget it. If I knew something useful to my country but prejudicial to Europe, or useful to Europe but prejudicial to humankind, I would regard it as a crime. For I am a man, he wrote, before I am a Frenchman, 
or rather, I am necessarily a man, while I am a Frenchman, only by chance. So here you see the full force of the moral logic that for the Enlightenment thinkers asserted the priority of universal human concern over the pull of particularity, particular loyalties and allegiances. But this passage from Montesquieu brings to mind a possible weakness, a moral limitation in the universalist conception of solidarity. Because if he's right that our universal loyalties should always take precedence over more local ones, then it would seem to follow that the distinction between friends and strangers should ideally be overcome. Our special concern for the welfare of friends would, if he's right, really be a kind of prejudice, a measure of our distance from universal human concern. And Montesquieu does not shrink from this conclusion because he goes on to write the following. A truly virtuous man would come to the aid of the most distant stranger as quickly as to his own friend. And then he concludes, if men were perfectly virtuous, they wouldn't have friends. It's difficult to imagine a world in which persons were so virtuous that they had no friends only a universal disposition to friendliness. The problem is not simply that such a world would be difficult to bring about. The problem is that it would be difficult to recognize as a human world. The love of humanity is a noble sentiment, but most of the time we live our lives by smaller solidarities. This may reflect certain limits to the bounds of moral sympathy. But more important, it reflects the fact that we learn to love humanity not in general, but through its particular expressions. And this begins to bring into focus the moral appeal of what I've called the situated or the particularist conception of solidarity. The German romantic philosopher Herder was among the first to affirm differences of language and culture and national identity as distinctive expressions of our humanity. He was scornful of the cosmopolitan citizen whose devotion to humankind is wholly abstract. The savage who loves himself, his wife and child with quiet joy, Herder wrote, and in his modest way works for the good of his tribe, is a truer being than that shadow of a man, the refined citizen of the world who, enraptured with the love of all his fellow shadows, loves but a chimera, an illusion. In practice, Herder writes, it is the savage in his poor hut who welcomes the stranger, quote, the inundated heart of the idle cosmopolite, on the other hand, offers shelter to nobody. Charles Dickens also caught the folly of the unsituated cosmopolitan with a character in his novel Bleak House, a character named Mrs. Jellyby, who woefully neglects her children while pursuing charitable causes overseas. She was, Dickens writes, she was a woman with handsome eyes, though they had a curious of habit, they had a curious habit of seeming to look a long way off, as if they could see nothing nearer than Africa. So Herder and Dickens are wary of the unsituated, abstract, 
universal aspiration. To affirm, well, and I should, and I should say this, I think they were onto something. I think they were onto something. To affirm as morally relevant the particular communities that locate us in the world, from neighborhoods to nations, is not to claim that we owe nothing to persons as persons, as fellow human beings. At their best, local solidarities gesture beyond themselves to broader horizons of moral concern, including the horizon of our common humanity. And so the cosmopolitan ethic is wrong, not for asserting that we have certain obligations to humanity as a whole, but rather for insisting, as Montesquieu does, that the more universal communities we inhabit must always take precedence over more particular ones. Well, what then does the more particularist or situated ethic of solidarity look like and how can it avoid, can it avoid, the darkness to which particular loyalties are prone? One defender of situated solidarity was Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He was an ardent defender of patriotism. He argued that communal attachments and identities are necessary supplements to our universal humanity. He puts it this way, it seems that the sentiment of humanity evaporates and weakens in being extended over the entire world. We cannot be affected by the calamities in Tartary or Japan the way we are by those of a European people. Interest and commiseration, Rousseau writes, must somehow be limited and restrained to be active. There, has to be, there have to be some bounds to solidarity if it's genuinely to activate sympathy and fellow feeling. Do we want people to be virtuous? This is Rousseau. Then let us begin, here's his case for patriotism, then let us begin by making them love their country. But how can they love it if their country means nothing more to them than it does to foreigners, allotting to them what it cannot refuse to anyone? Now, in this defense of patriotism, of situated solidarity, of Rousseau. We see the moral force, the inspirational force, but we also see the potential shadow of darkness, of exclusivism. I began by distinguishing universal, the universal conception of solidarity from the situated or particularist one. But now I think it's important to make a further distinction. There are actually two different accounts of a situated or particularist conception of solidarity. One you might call the us against them particularism. The other I would call the solidarity of indebtedness and mutual responsibility. If, now here's the philosophical argument that I would like to propose. If the critics of a purely universalist, abstract, or cosmopolitan conception of solidarity have a point, if certain solidarities depend on a sense of belonging or membership or common life with particular others, then 
How is it possible to distinguish between the us against them version of solidarity and the more open, contestable, pluralistic solidarity that I've called the solidarity of indebtedness and mutual responsibility? Well, the answer to that question begins by noticing a certain feature of what it is to recognize obligations of membership, responsibilities, special responsibilities, beyond what we owe to humankind as such, special responsibilities that flow from being engaged in a common project or a shared history. There's a tendency to think that obligations of solidarity bound up with a particular sense of belonging are really just instances of collective selfishness, a prejudice for our own people, our own kind. But then the question quickly arises, isn't this heightened concern for one's own people a parochial, inward-looking tendency that we should try to overcome, rather than, than valorize in the name of patriotism or solidarity. Not necessarily. Not if you recognize that obligations of solidarity and membership can point outward as well as inward. Some of the special responsibilities that flow from the particular communities and identities that claim me, I may owe to fellow members. But others, I may owe to those with whom my community has a morally burdened history. As in the relation, for example, of Germans to Jews, or of American whites to African Americans. We hear a lot of debate these days in public life about collective apologies, even reparations, for historic injustices. And part of the, the debate is whether properly understood moral responsibility is wholly individual. I'm responsible for righting the wrongs that I personally committed. Or whether moral responsibility can reach across generations, whether it has sometimes a collective dimension. Public apologies and reparations for historic wrongs are good examples of the way that sometimes solidarity can create moral responsibilities toward communities other than my own making amends for my country's past wrongs is actually one way of affirming my allegiance to that community. Sometimes solidarity can give us special reason to criticize our own people or the actions of our own government. Sometimes patriotism can compel consent. Consider two different grounds on which people might have opposed the Vietnam War and protested against it. One was the belief that the war was unjust. The other was the belief that the war was unworthy of us, say, of Americans, at odds with who we are as a people. Now, the first ground of protest, the first reason, can be taken up by opponents of the war whoever they are, wherever they live. But the second reason, it's unworthy of us. This can only be felt and voiced by citizens of the country responsible for the war. A Swede could oppose the Vietnam War and consider it unjust, but only an American could feel ashamed of it. Pride and shame, these are moral 
sentiments that presuppose a shared identity. Take a trivial example, rather than these rather momentous ones. Americans traveling abroad can be embarrassed when they encounter boorish behavior by other American tourists, even though they don't know them personally. Non-Americans might find the same behavior disreputable, but couldn't be embarrassed by it. The capacity for pride and shame in the actions of family members and fellow citizens is related to the capacity for collective responsibility. What they have in common is this. Both require seeing ourselves as situated selves implicated in the narratives that shape our identity as moral agents. So, the possibility that some situated particularist solidarities and loyalties can actually give rise to obligations that point outward, not just to help our own kind, suggest at least one important difference between the us and them version of situated solidarity and the solidarity of indebtedness and mutual responsibility. Now, the distinctions I've just offered, the account of solidarity that I've just proposed, is a philosophical account. How does this account of solidarity help us diagnose our present political circumstance? And how might the distinctions that I've proposed, and in particular, the third conception of solidarity, situated but not us against them, how might that conception, if we could articulate it, and realize it in public life, how might it begin to address the challenge democracy faces today? So let me turn now to the second part of the account, the lecture that I promised. What is it that led us to the present political peril that democracy faces? And what might be done about it? How might we renovate the moral and civic basis of our public life to address the discontents that led to the circumstances we now face. These are dangerous times for democracy. Places that once offered democratic hope are now drifting toward authoritarianism. Democracy is also in trouble in sturdier places, including in my own country. What's striking, and here I'm going to speak mainly about the American case, and you will be the judges to what extent these observations bear on Poland. That's a safer way for an observer to offer a commentary on, um, on a place that he's visiting and observing and trying to take in. What I would like to suggest is that, and here I'll speak about Trump, despite the threat he's posed to democratic norms, despite the chaos and erratic behavior, it would seem that the opposition, Democrats, liberals, would have an easy job of offering an alternative, but it hasn't turned out that way. What's really dangerous about the current moment, and here I'm speaking more generally, is that the opposition, the small d democratic opposition to right-wing populism and hyper-nationalism is in disarray, in moral and political and ideological disarray. That's the danger 
more than the fact that these guys have won power. Now, this leads to the question, why did this happen in the first place? And the reason it happened is that Trump and other uh, right-wing nationalists were elected by tapping into a wellspring of anxieties and frustrations and legitimate grievances to which the mainstream parties have offered no compelling answer. This means that for those who are worried about hyper-nationalists and right-wing populists, it's not enough to mobilize a politics of protest and resistance. It's also necessary to engage in a politics of persuasion. And such a politics has to begin by understanding the discontent that is roiling politics in democracies around the world. Well, what is the source of that discontent? We've seen it in Brexit in the UK. We've seen it with the National Front and Marine Le Pen in France, though she didn't win in the second round. We've seen it in the election of Trump. We've seen it in Poland. The election or the, the appeal of these figures and parties is an angry verdict on decades of rising inequality and a version of globalization that benefits those at the top but leaves ordinary people disempowered. Their triumph is also a rebuke to a technocratic approach to politics that is tone deaf to the resentments of people who feel the economy and culture have left them behind. Now, some people, many of us, denounce the upsurge of populism as little more than a racist, xenophobic reaction against immigrants and multiculturalism. And others see it in mainly economic terms as a protest against the job losses brought about by global trade and new technologies. It is both of these things, but it's a mistake to see only the bigotry in populist protest or to view it as only an economic complaint. To do so misses the fact that the upheavals of the past two, three years were a political response to a political failure of historic proportions. The right-wing populism ascendant today is a symptom of the failure of liberal politics. In the US, the Democratic Party has become a party of technocratic liberalism, more congenial to the professional classes than to the blue collar and middle class voters who once constituted its base. And a similar predicament afflicts center left parties in many democratic countries. How did this happen? The roots of the predicament in the West, go back to the 1980s. Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher had argued that government was the problem and markets were the solution. But even when they passed from the political scene, the center-left politicians who succeeded them, Bill Clinton in the US, Tony Blair in Britain, Gerhard Schroeder in Germany, they moderated, but they consolidated the market faith. They softened the harsh edges of unfettered markets, but they didn't challenge the central premise of the Reagan-Thatcher era that market mechanisms are the primary instruments for achieving the public good. In line with this faith, they, the center-left political parties and leaders, they embraced a market-driven version of globalization, and they welcomed the growing financialization of the economy. And this continued through the 1990s. Meanwhile, in Poland, something similar was underway. In the 1990s, the shock therapy followed by the embrace of the neoliberal market economy. What happened through the 90s and early 2000s is that we lost hold of the distinction 
and here I'm speaking generally of these democratic countries, we lost hold of the distinction between having a market economy and becoming a market society. The difference is this. A market economy is a tool, a valuable and effective tool for organizing productive activity. But a market society is a place where everything is up for sale. It's a, it's a way of life in which market thinking and market values begin to dominate every aspect of life. Not only the buying and selling of, of material goods like cars and toasters and flat screen televisions. Market thinking and market values begin to dominate family life and personal relations, health, education, the media, politics, civic life, law. And when they do, as they did, market thinking and market values begin to crowd out non-market values worth caring about. I wrote about this in my most recent book, came out several years ago, What Money Can't Buy. And when I went around the world giving talks about it, often I would put questions about people's views about market transactions to the audience. So I got a pretty good unscientific sense of where in the world people had the deepest faith in free market individualism and where there was more skepticism to be found in the public culture. In my unscientific survey, I found that there were three countries that were most resistant, I mean, here, speaking impressionistically, based on the reactions and the discussions in the halls, most resistant to, any, to my suggestion that we should keep markets in their place and that their place isn't everywhere. In most countries in Europe, there are strong cultural resources that support a certain skepticism toward the overreach of markets true for the most part in continental Europe, to a somewhat lesser extent in Britain. In Japan, likewise, different cultural sources, but uh, limiting the out thoroughgoing embrace of free market individualism. Likewise in Latin America. There were three countries where I found the most powerful, most intense, the deepest faith in free market individualism, just on an intuitive level. Can you guess what those three countries were? Well, one, one was the United States, one was China, and the other was Poland. Now, it's unusual company, you might think. Uh, understandable, understandable, Given the stereotypes, some stereotypes have elements of truth about the United States and its embrace of markets, market individualism. In the case of China and Poland, though radically different in many respects, these were both places that had come to the embrace of free markets relatively late by comparison to the other countries, and both had enjoyed enormous benefits and economic growth and rising prosperity and abundance. So it's understandable. It's understandable. It's also striking. Now this, this tour after that book, I suppose was about, it was about four years ago. Was that it? Cassia, something like that. Now, about four years later, all three of those countries are governed by strong hyper-nationalist regimes. Maybe it's a coincidence, but I don't think so. I think, to the contrary, that the populist uprising 
we've seen throughout Britain and Europe is a backlash. It's a backlash against elites of the mainstream parties. But it's also a backlash against a kind of unqualified faith in a neoliberal version of global capitalism that has left large portions of the population feeling left behind. And more than that, a version of neoliberal global capitalism that has shaped the public culture and created a vacuum of meaning and of belonging and of identity. And this can be seen especially in the three cases I just mentioned, but in throughout much of Europe as well. So how to respond? If liberal, that the established liberal elites and political parties missed this in their embrace of market thinking as a way to arrive at the public good, what might, what might an alternative look like? Well, that's our question. That's what we have to figure out. The beginning of an answer is this. Before they can begin to win back public support, liberal parties, progressive parties, need to rethink their mission and purpose. And to do this, they should learn from the populist protest that displaced them. That may seem heretical, especially in this room. But by learning from the populist protest, I don't mean replicating the xenophobia and the strident nationalism. I mean taking seriously the legitimate grievances with which these ugly sentiments are entangled. The rethinking should begin with the recognition that these grievances are not only economic, they're also moral and cultural. They're not only about wages and jobs, they're also about dignity and social esteem. Now, uh, let me suggest four specific themes that liberal parties, center-left parties, democratic, small-d democratic parties, need to address in order to begin to articulate a new public philosophy, a new kind of public debate. First, they have to do a better job of addressing income inequality. The standard response to inequality for these parties has been to call for greater equality of opportunity, retraining workers, improving access to education, all of which are good things. It summed up this response in the slogan that those who work hard and play by the rules should be able to rise as far as their talents and efforts will take them. But this response to inequality now rings increasingly hollow. It fails to inspire as it once did. This is partly because upward mobility is much harder than the American dream advertised it to be. People born poor tend to stay poor. Even in America, in fact, upward mobility in the US is among the lowest of all developed countries, not the highest. But it's not just that mobility has stalled. It's that people sense that there is something missing in the ideal, even, of solving inequality with upward mobility. So progressives, liberals, should reconsider the assumption that mobility alone can compensate for inequality. They need to reason and reckon directly with inequalities of power and wealth, rather than simply rest content with the project of helping people uh, scramble up a ladder whose rungs are growing further and further apart. 
So to deal, here's an, to put it in a phrase, what liberal democratic parties need to reimagine is a response to inequality that does not rely only on the promise of mobility. Well, we'll get you out of this, or some of you. That focuses, a, a, a vision that focuses less on mobility and more on solidarity. Because the project of solidarity doesn't say, don't worry about the inequality, some of you can climb out of it. The project of solidarity says, those on top and those who end up at the bottom are indebted to one another and are responsible for one another. Even if not everybody, or even if not most people, scramble up those, the rungs of that ladder. Now, this is not so easy to do, this shift from mobility to solidarity, for the following reason. And this brings me to the second theme. I call it meritocratic hubris. Do we have a good Polish translation of meritocratic hubris? The, the problem with inequality today is not just an economic problem. The relentless emphasis on creating a fair meritocracy in which social positions represent effort and talent, this has a corrosive effect on the way we interpret our success or the lack of it. The notion that the system ultimately rewards talent and hard work is corrosive because it encourages the winners to consider their success their own doing a measure of their virtue and by implication to look down upon those less fortunate than themselves. In so far as we live in a true meritocracy, those on the top can inhale deeply of their own success. I made it thanks to my own doing. I morally deserve the fruits that flow from the exercise of my talents. That's what I mean by meritocratic hubris. It not only leads those on top to look down upon those at the bottom as more or less belonging there, it also deprives them of a certain humility. And what about those at the bottom? Those who lose, lose out. They may feel the system is rigged, that the winners have cheated and manipulated their way to the top, or they may harbor the demoralizing thought that their failure may be their own doing. Maybe I, I'm down here because I lack the talent and the effort to, to succeed. Maybe I'm down here, maybe it is my own fault that I failed to adapt as quickly and as readily to what the new economic order required. And that's a deeply demoralizing thought. So it's one thing to say the system is rigged, it's unfair, but it's something even more insidious to believe that I landed here on the, on the bottom or in the disadvantaged circumstance because I sort of deserve it. I didn't adapt quickly enough. I didn't expend the kind of effort. I don't have the talents. And when this interpretation of social places becomes more deeply entrenched. They give rise to anger and resentment against elites, and this fuels populist protest. Donald Trump, though he's a billionaire, he understands this resentment. He never spoke of opportunity, by the way. He, he uses blunt talk of winners and losers. But a democratic response needs to lean against this meritocratic hubris, and here's where an ethic of solidarity, which appreciates the contingency, the luck, the giftedness that leads to success in market economies. It conduces to a certain humility, solidarity does, and with it a sense of mutual responsibility for those with less luck or good fortune. 
A third theme that needs to inform a revitalized democratic public life is to speak openly and creatively about the dignity of work. The loss of jobs to technology and outsourcing has coincided with the sense that society accords less respect to the kind of work the working class does. And there's something else. Economic activity has been shifting from making things to managing money. And society lavishes greater and greater rewards on hedge fund managers and bankers. And the effect of this, quite apart from the unfairness that people complain about, the effect of this is subtly to undermine the esteem accorded work in the traditional sense. One of the striking things, if you read Father Tishner's essay on solidarity, though it's, it's the solidarity is in the title, it's really an essay about work and about the dignity of work. The significance we give today to the idea of solidarity, he writes, is a particular way bound to the reality of human work. Solidarity turns out to be a communion of working people who strive to free human work from the hardships and suffering caused by other human beings. So the essence, he argues, that the essence of solidarity has to do with asserting and affirming the dignity of work. And this is how he interpreted the strikes. And the moral as well as the political significance of the strikes. So the dignity of work. And finally, a fourth theme, patriotism and national community. Now liberals, almost instinctively, say this is very dangerous terrain. This is what authoritarians traffic in, talk of national identity, nationalism, patriotism. And in the elections, the elections of the populists, free trade agreements and immigration, these are the most potent flashpoints of populist anger. And on one level, these are economic issues. But at a deeper level, something more is at stake. Workers who believe that their country cares more for cheap goods and cheap labor than for the job prospects of its own people feel betrayed. This sense of betrayal often finds ugly, intolerant expression, a hatred of immigrants, a strident nationalism that vilifies Muslims and other outsiders, a rhetoric of taking back our country. Now, liberals reply, the instinctive liberal reply, is to condemn the hateful rhetoric, to insist on the virtues of mutual respect and multicultural understanding. And this is a principled response and a valid response. But it falls, sh falls short. It falls short because it fails to address an important set of questions implicit in the populist complaint. What is the moral significance, uh, if any, of national borders? Do we owe more to our fellow citizens than we owe citizens of other countries? Should we cultivate national identities? Or in a global age, should we aspire to a cosmopolitan ethic of universal human concern? Now, although Father Tishner began his essay with the Good Samaritan parable, which suggests that he's a universalist, uh, that he holds the universalist conception of solidarity. He emphasizes patriotism. He, his conception of solidarity is of the situated kind, as you read through the essay. And he has a, a chapter that in English is translated as, as fatherland. It's about patriotism. It's about national identity. The question of the fatherland, he writes, looms over our conscience. We feel this. There is a Polish conscience within us. 
This conscience rules each of us individually and at the same time rules our entire nation. The voice of Polish conscience leads us through the windings of history and it points to values. So what begins with Father Tishner is a universalistic account with the Good Samaritan of solidarity. Clearly becomes by the time he discusses work and here he's writing about what the, the struggle for the dignity of work in the shipyards. It's a situated account of solidarity. And then when he talks about patriotism, a Polish conscience, that's a situated ethic of solidarity. That's not a, a universalistic cosmopolitan one. And there's, there's a moral importance in that situated dimension. And so these, it seems to me, are the, were the blind spots of liberal elites and center-left parties that presided over a period of neoliberal global capitalism that left patriotism as an issue for the right wing to concern itself with. And in response, we've seen a backlash. We've seen a backlash above all against the vacuum of meaning and purpose that a purely market-driven neoliberal capitalist society creates. The danger is that that vacuum of meaning will be filled by narrow authoritarian hyper-nationalist alternatives. That's the default source of meaning that will fill a vacuum left open by seemingly tolerant liberal elites and political parties. And the only way, I think, to address the real danger to democratic norms and institutions that we see with these populist movements around the world is to reimagine democratic public discourse in a way that reconnects it to stronger traditions of solidarity than a purely market-driven approach to public life can provide. And the kind of solidarity to which it must appeal can't only be the universalistic or the cosmopolitan conception of solidarity. Because that's too thin to fill, or to answer the aspiration to meaning and common purpose. It requires the situated understanding of solidarity to do with the character of work and of patriotism, of, what, of, of an interpretation of the meaning of success, the mutual responsibility that goes, that, that holds a society together. It's not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing, especially at a time when we're preoccupied. It seems, well, no, the immediate challenge is to deal with these threats to democracy. But we're not going to deal with those threats unless we find a compelling way of recasting the terms of public discourse. To articulate and energize a conception of solidarity in this sense requires a richer moral and even spiritual public discourse than the kind to which we've become accustomed. Some, some liberals fear this kind of discourse because it's tempting to worry that bringing moral and spiritual argument into public discourse opens the way to coercion and to disagreement and to the imposition of values on some that they may not agree with. But paradoxically, it's this very allergy to engaging in public discourse, 
with moral and spiritual arguments that has created the vacuum, that has created the void, that has been filled by narrow, intolerant, fundamentalist or nationalist alternatives. Father Tishner wrote, and this is after observing the spectacular and unpredictable events in the shipyard. Hope, he wrote, hope is awakening that things and events can be changed. And in every time it seems, it's hard to believe. It's very hard to believe that things and events can be changed. The way things are, the momentum of technology and the global economy seem to resist any meaningful change. And now the rise of populist and authoritarian political movements seem to resist the thought that event things and events can be changed. But the example of solidarity, the event, but also the ideal, offer a resource, not a blueprint, but an inspiration for how things and events could be changed with some moral and civic reimagining today. Thank you all very much. Dziękuję bardzo. Dużym, ważnym życzeniem profesora Sandela było to, żeby to się nie skończyło na jego tylko wypowiedzi. Bardzo prosił też o udział państwa. Przy takiej ilości nie jest to łatwe. Także zacznijmy może od trzech pytań. OK. Proszę bardzo, mamy dwa mikrofony. Tak. Tam pan był pierwszy, proszę bardzo. Thank you for a very interesting lecture. Będę mówił po polsku, będzie mi łatwiej. Ja mam krótkie pytanie, ponieważ był z wielu chętnych. Czy mógłby pan z perspektywy profesora amerykańskiego próbować zdefiniować różnicę, jak pan to postrzega z amerykańskiej perspektywy, pomiędzy patriotyzmem a nacjonalizmem? To będzie szczególnie interesujące, bo interesujący jest naród amerykański. Dziękuję. Dziękuję bardzo. Może zmienimy stronę. Mamy po tamtej stronie mikrofon. Tak, proszę tutaj pana. Good evening, Mr. Professor. I wanted to ask you, because while talking about the meritocratic hubris um, and what it means for solidarity, uh, you mentioned Trump and uh, Le Pen as an example and uh, how they all speak to a sense of solidarity. And I was thinking, because Trump, as you said, talks about losers and winners, and a big theme of his campaign is uh, jobs being stolen. In France, uh, the big theme of Le Pen's campaign was uh, French workers being discriminated by uh, the um, European Union and so forth. So would you not say that even though uh, the theme appears to be solidarity, the true theme is the feeling by those who vote for these people, that they could be winners if they had uh, better borders or etc. So it's not really a rejection of the meritocratic loser-winners dichotomy, but a reaffirmation of it, a desire to be the winner. Jeszcze jedno pytanie. One question more and then you can answer. Well, let me just quickly. Okay, so all quickly right. this. All right. Um, yes, you're right. You're right that this is a good analysis. The winners and losers, Trump and Le Pen, uh, try to inspire the hope that the losers can become the winners. 
In fact, Trump said repeatedly during his campaign, you're, America's going to win so much you're going to get tired of winning. <laughs> so far, I haven't noticed anyone who's gotten tired of winning since his election. But that would seem to contradict the idea that they're calling into question meritocracy. But I think the people who respond to the rhetoric of winners and losers are lashing out with an anger against feeling that they've lost out and that no one is listening to them. I don't think they have thought through the logic of moral desert and so on that's involved in the meritocratic ethic. They sense, they have a nagging sense of inadequacy and injustice together. So uh, I'm trying to identify not what worked for Trump and Le Pen as the solution. I'm trying to uh, analyze the deeper problem that liberals and Democrats have to figure out if they're to provide a genuine response to the anger and grievance that the winner and loser rhetoric taps into. And as for the difference between patriotism and nationalism, I don't think this is a uniquely American distinction. Um, actually, I, I would not insist that on, on a distinction between the two. I think that they, patriotism and nationalism Nationalism tends to, to refer to the us against them version of solidarity that I spoke about. Patriotism sometimes is also associated with the us against them solidarity. But there are traditions of patriotic dissent that break through the us against them version. Nationalism in principle can work the same way. If I take my national identity seriously, I appeal to the values of this national tradition, sometimes to criticize the policy of my government or of my people, whether in the past or in the present. So I think the important distinction is between these two different versions of situated solidarity. The us against them, exclusivist version, and the more pluralist solidarity of indebtedness and mutual responsibility. But I think patriotism and nationalism might not capture that distinction. And it's that distinction that I think is the most important. Third one, uh, trzecie, tutaj pan, proszę bardzo, był wcześniej, za chwilkę. Dokonał pan profesor przeglądu koncepcji. Właściwie byliśmy w filozofii oświecenia Zaczęliśmy od dużych nazwisk, a zakończyliśmy na współczesności i Trumpie. Ja chciałbym zapytać, czy zgodzi się pan profesor z taką hipotezą? Pójdźmy 30 lat do przodu. Profesor Bauman, mój profesor, mówił o płynnej nowoczesności, w której jesteśmy zatopieni w tej chwili na całym świecie. Czy za 30 lat będzie jeszcze miejsce na demokratyczne procesy wyłaniania władzy, czy nie będzie to już tylko produkt maszyn politycznych, które ze względu na zwiększającą się ilość uzależnień informatycznych, tego co wiemy, jak można sterować człowiekiem, jego emocjami, będzie tak, czy będziemy nadal w sytuacji, w której będziemy oczekiwać na kolejne cudy kolejnych Solidarności? It needs a... All right. All right, an immediate answer. Well, people now who are impressed with artificial intelligence are making all kinds of predictions, dramatic predictions, 
about what artificial intelligence and smart machines may be able to do. Right now, we know that they can beat a chess champion at chess. And soon they may be able to drive cars better than we can with fewer accidents. Uh, that would not shock me. But stronger claims are being made, including the claim you ask about, which is whether machines could pick our political leaders, or for that matter, why bother with picking political leaders if the machines are that smart, let them govern. Some, you know, one, one test of what sh how likely this is, um, you can test it. I sometimes test it with my students. Most students these days have dating apps, you know, where you can try to find a, a date online. Maybe this audience is not all that familiar with dating apps, <laughs> but your, your kids are. And so the hypothetical I ask my students is, suppose the dating app or the smart machine became so smart and had so much data about you, access to your emails, your Facebook account, the movies you watch on Netflix, everything. That's a lot of data. Suppose there arose a marriage prediction machine that could identify the three, of, in all the world, in all the world, the three most suitable marriage partners for you. Whose judgment would you trust more, I ask the students, the marriage prediction app or your parents, if they nominated the people you should marry? Now, maybe that's making the question too easy because most kids don't want their parents to choose their mates. But the general question is whether artificial intelligence will be able to exercise the kinds of judgments that involve values, whether political values, in the case of your example, or values about friendship and marriage even, in the case of the marriage prediction machine. I, myself, I doubt it. I doubt that the algorithms can capture the values that are at stake, in part because in the domain of politics and also of love, it's not only the result that matters, it's how we get there. And the human trials and mistakes and blunders and confusions and learning that goes along with the mistakes we make when we engage in politics or when we try to find a friend or for that matter a lifelong partner. So for that, for that reason, I doubt it. Panie profesorze, dziękuję bardzo serdecznie za wykład, za spotkanie. Dziękuję bardzo.